Hello, my name is Austin Belzner, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast. But before we get into the podcast, I gotta tell you how you can support my work. The way I find my work, whether it be a review of a movie I rent or paying for Zoom, my Patreon is the way you can help offset those costs. Patrons like MB Labula, Brian Scuttle, Joseph Davis of Sif Hop, Matthew Simpson of Boston Friday, Tom Blackburn, and more all help to make episodes like this possible. So thank you to all you lovely patrons out there. Beyond financial support, you get some pretty sweet perks in exchange for that financial support. Whether you're into 24 hours, our early access to my reviews and this podcast, monthly surveys, giving direct feedback, commentaries, and just about everything in between. Consider becoming a patron for as low as $1 a month at patreon.com slash austinbmedia. You can also save 16% off if you decide to subscribe annually. On top of that, it, if you're not ready to subscribe for whatever reason, you can get a seven-day free trial for every single tier I offer, even the more expensive ones. So with that, I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, my name is Austin Belzer, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast. Today, I will be discussing the seventh film in the Tom Cruise-led spy action thriller, whatever you want to call it, series, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1, with my guest, Pedro Pedro Lima. I don't know why my brain had a brain fart there, but welcome to the podcast, Pedro. Tell everyone what you've been working on recently, what you've published, and where we can follow you. Oh, okay. Hi, guys. First of all, thank you, Austin, for having me on the podcast. So my name is Pedro Lima. I'm a writer from Brazil. So right now I'm writing for Short Stick. That is a a website that we talk about festivals and short film festivals and short films that may have potential on the award season. So I have been publishing there. And also you can find me at uh, Pedro underline Lima 101 at Twitter and Pedro Lima at Pedro underline Lima at Letterboxd to see what I'm watching. Awesome. I'll make sure to follow you if I'm not already on Letterboxd. I'm probably following you, but just in case, I'll make sure <laughs> I am after we get off here and I start editing everything. But before we move into our Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, which is, by the way, a mouthful. So I think from here on out, I'm just going to call it MI7 or Dead Reckoning Part 1. Something new I've been doing is asking people, before we get into our discussion, shout out and things like that. Like any movies, TV shows you're watching. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Yesterday was a holiday here in Brazil, so I had plenty of time to catch on screeners and movies that I was behind. So I'm watching a lot of the Oscars international feature submissions. So yesterday I watched Anthony Chan's The Breaking Ice. That is a, I, I really enjoy it as a movie. I also watched today the Bob Wine, People's President. This one is, I didn't like that much. You but also like it. no, it was not for me. I, I watched the. I'm. A, I, I didn't <laughs> talk about that, but I'm. I'm a member, so we have a lot of Ida International Documentary Association. So I have a lot of documentary screeners, and so just to cite another two that I I watched yesterday or the day before, it was Everybody, it was a very good doc that was in Tribeca, was directed by Julia Cohen. That was. Nominated for the Oscars for that that doc RBG RBJ, mm-hmm. and also I watched the Silver Dollar Road by Rob Beck, that premiered at TIFF, and also didn't like that much, but yeah, <laughs> basically these are like the movies that I'm watching. I'm watching a lot of international stuff and documentary stuff that I have to catch on due to screeners and a lot of movies. That we have to see but yeah it's nice it's nice to watch documentaries international features and also i'm very excited to watch next week killers of the flower moon haven't watched have you watched yet no i haven't in fact i have to make a special trip to see that movie yeah, um, yeah. because i live in quite a rural area so mm-hmm. i have to go to the local alamo draft house to go see it which is about two hours away I think that Scorsese is worth it and to watch at a, a big theater and 
I'm dying to see it. I don't know if you read the book, but the book is really good. No, uh, I haven't. Yeah. But in a interview I did, I guess in January, for Mur Murder in Bighorn, the director or showrunner, I think, recommended I either watch the movie or read the book because they're Murder in Bighorn and Killers of the Flower Moon have to deal with similar topics. Oh, about the offside in the, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great book, a great book, and I'm really excited to watch Scorsese. And I also recommend Scorsese last week did a Q&A with Edgar Wright. It is on YouTube, on the BFI YouTube. It's a one hour and a half uh, video, and it's awesome to, it, it's a masterclass of Scorsese talking about his movies and about uh, cinema in general. So yeah, that's basically what, what I'm watching recently. I'll have, to, I'll have to include that in the show notes. I I don't think I've seen that yet. Yeah, I can send you the, the link. It's in the BFI YouTube channel. And I watched it yesterday. It's really great because Edgar Wright is also a guy that loves cinema and knows. He has a movie list with a thousand movies called Edgar Wright's Favorite Movies of All Time. It's a hundred a thousand movies. So he's a guy that knows a lot of, about cinema, and Scorsese is Scorsese, so they both do a great together. Yeah, I think the last movie I, and maybe, no, it wasn't the only movie. The first movie I watched Scorsese's was Shutter Island, I think. Yeah, me too, yeah. And then I think, what was his next one? Irishman, after oh, that? No, it was Wolf of Wall Street. Okay, that's one I'm like, Two thirds of the way through because also a three hour movie and I'm like, okay, yeah, I need to just <laughs> marathon that movie. And it's a movie I understand you having this kind of struggle to finish because it's a high octane movie and happens a lot of things and it's too intense and a lot of so I understand. But after that, he he did Silence, and then he did The Irishman. I meant to see Silence. I really did. But I think something else came out when that movie not, came out. Yeah, if I'm not wrong, Silence was released in Christmas Day in the US in 2016. And I mm -hmm. think that La Land was released around the That's time. That's probably it, yeah. Around the time. I'm not sure. I can confirm later. But yeah, I, I also didn't watch Silence. It's, it's probably one of his most underwatched and movie but i think i'll watch it before killers of farm yeah i might do that too especially because tiktok's been recommending that in, I, just, I just get <laughs> random tiktok clips of movies mm -hmm. i'm like and i i'll occasionally get clips of silence in there and i'm like okay i guess i'll watch this whole yeah, thing and it seems great i watched also a lot of clips of it, and it seems great. Leonis and Andrew Garfield seems really great. And it talked about TikTok. I remember that I watched this with the TikTok that Francesca Scorsese did with uh, <laughs> yeah, her father. That. Yeah, it's awesome. She She's teaching him some uh, new generation, Gen Z slangs. It's very, very funny. Yeah, he talked about uh, how King of Comedy was slept on, and he started it was calling out on. names. Yeah, and he talks about that in the BFI masterclass, yeah. and he yeah he talks about that, and he also call out a lot of names, and he talks about how the media at the time did not give the movie what it deserved. Yeah, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, but with that said, yeah, I'll, I'll include all those links. It's just gonna be a bevy of links. It's probably just gonna be a paragraph at this point. <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of links. Yeah. But with that said, I think we I think we'll move on to the discussion part. So for those who haven't watched or listened to my podcast discussion with oh gosh, I forgot the creator <laughs> podcast. I forgot who I had on for the guest. Sorry because I know we're super close. But we talked about we had a spoiler discussion after the spoiler-free discussion and that's how we'll be doing it this time. If you haven't seen the movie, there will be a clear point where I say, hey, this is the end of our spoiler-free discussion. Because I think, like the creator, there's a lot to talk about with the spoilers in this movie. Less so in the way that 
Mission Impossible Fallout or Rogue Nation or Ghost Protocol, any of the previous MI movies really had a, a central plot. There is one in Fallout, but that was more like, hey, here's the twist. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But with that said, since I'm already talking about the MI films in particular, what has been, what, what's your history with the Mission Impossible films? Did you watch Ghost Protocol first, or did you grow up with Mission Impossible? Uh, what was your entry point? Yeah, I don't recall if I watched the three first, the three first ones before I watched Ghost Protocol. I think I did watch like the, the first one, the John Woo's Mission Impossible, and MI3 on the TV. I remember that it was very popular on TV at, around the time. It was like that kind of movie. So late 2000s, it was very usual to have that kind of movie on TV. So Born, Mission Impossible, that kind of action movie that was really popular at the time. And, but the first one that I was like, a, a bit more, a, a bit older, I think it was nine when it came out, it was Ghost Protocol. So I remember watching it with my father. We rented out on a video store and uh -huh. watched it. And it is it's still my favorite one. And I think it's because of Redbird, the way that he directed, it's, it's very fun. At that time, I didn't know, but I was already a Redbird fan due to the Iron Giant and Incredibles. And even Tomorrowland that is not like a great movie, but it has a lot of great action scenes. He's very good at directing action scenes because he's, he's an animation guy and he knows how to draw the action pieces. And I took a while to watch the other ones. And I watched like recently before the Dead Reckoning when I was supposed to surgery. And I had a lot of time, so I said, oh, I, I'm going to watch uh, Rogue Nation and Fallout. Time. Yeah, I, I had a lot of time, so I, I watched Rogue Nation and Fallout. And then I went to see this new one. So uh, that's basically my history, but I'm a big fan of Ghost Protocol due to Brad Bird. Interesting. Mine is, I, we saw Ghost Protocol in theaters, or I saw Ghost Protocol in theaters with my family. and. From there, I just we, I think we also watched Rogue Nation in theaters, and then I watched Fallout by myself because I'd moved out by that point, and then full circle, Dead Reckoning Part One with family this time. But in between, I think Fallout or maybe, yeah, I think between Fallout and Dead Reckoning, I think in the run up to Dead Reckoning or maybe Fallout, I can't remember. In the run up to one of the more recent ones. I went back and saw Emma the whole series again. Even going back to go, I oh, did Mi one, two, three, four, five, six, all in a row. So yeah, because I was like, okay, yeah, it was Fallout because there was thing in the run up to Fallout because I remember thinking, what's going on uh, with. I guess we could spoil Fallout, right? It's been a few years. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's five years, I think. Yeah, so Michelle Monaghan shows up in Fallout, and I'm like, oh, wait, why is she in it? In this? <laughs> so I, I went back and watched those ones, and Fallout ended up being my favorite so far of, actually, to date, it is my favorite Mission Impossible movie because of just how ef not efficient the action is, but it just really put you on the edge of your seat. Um, yeah, I, I think uh -huh. it's the scope that Christopher McQuire uh, brings uh, to that. He has a, a action vision that is, is really impressive, the way that he builds his action scenes. So yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, and I almost forgot he directed this one. I was thinking about Top Gun Maverick for a second. I was like, for a second, oh, yeah. I got the two mixed up. Um, yeah, uh, Top Gun Maverick was directed by Kozinski, Joseph Kozinski, written by McQuire. So yeah, all the Tom Cruise verse is written or directed by Christopher McQuire. I think they, they have a really good time working together. Yeah, but yeah, that, those are my experiences with the film to date. So I think 
that kind of goes into our expectations for the film. Personally, going off of Fallout, my expectations were like right up here. Just yeah, really high. Yeah. Sky high. Uh, because I just got served one of the best action movies of all time. I don't see how they could miss. So I'm just... I, I remember getting chills in the movie theater when I saw the trailer in theaters in front of Top Gun Maverick. Like, I was just so ready. I was like, inject it into my veins. Please give me the yeah. new Mission Impossible. And, um, and I think that, j just adding something about the, the trailer, the movie trailer, I think I also, I think it was also Top Gun Maverick when I watched, I first watched the trailer. I, I don't usually watch trailers. I just watch when I'm at the movie theater. But I remember that the score is very effective to make you, like, feel emotional and excited to the movie. And later I'll talk about what I think about the the music score of Dead Reckoning. That does not uh, achieve that, but... Not even yeah. close. Not even close. And, but we can talk about the, the score later. Yeah. So yeah, what were your expectations? coming from Fallout to this movie? The expectations were high because I, I think also because of Top Gun Maverick and all like this narrative that after the pandemic, Tom Cruise was like the guy to, to save cinema and to save the movie theaters. His movies were like scattered and rescheduled a lot of times to get like the best theatrical release. And we, I also want to talk about that later. But I was expecting a lot, and the trader is very efficient to to make you expect. So expectations were also high, also very high, and due to the, the score, also the score on the trader is very atmospheric. So I was really excited to this one. Yeah, it it has like that classic. They add uh, the drums in just very slowly. Yeah. So that when you get to the end of the trail, it's like, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, boom, it gets, gets, yeah, it gets very high and very energetic. So yeah, it's very nice. The music yeah. on the trailer. <laughs> yeah, on the trailer. But I guess since we're already talking about about it, let's talk about like the background of the movie. One thing I specifically want to get your thoughts on, and I think. I, I don't know if they backtracked on this, but they were going to shoot this back-to-back, -back, MI7 and MI8 back-to-back. -back. I, I think they, they, they would do it, but due to the pandemic, and due to the pandemic, they had to shoot one, then shoot the other one, because the budget got out of track. Uh, this one costs uh, two, uh, $291 million. That is like very high budget and so just for com comparison a uh, rogue nation has a uh, 150 million dollars budget so this one is like a double of it so i think they they did not shoot this one and i think it was a missed opportunity they couldn't they couldn't imagine that but i think it's a missed opportunity due to the strikes that happened right now so they will have to wait a bit of time to, to finish the, the part two. Those kind of movies have shoots and reshoots and a lot of small details. But yes, I, I think they could shoot them back to back. Yeah, and we'll get into this in a little bit more in spoilers, but it definitely feels constructed as a part, part one. one and part two. Yeah. Because I'll, I'll get in, into more why when we talk about spoilers. But, but yeah, a... I definitely think the I I'm of the same of cohort basically, but and I think it put a lot of pressure going into what you were saying about Top Gun Maverick and how these two movies tied together, Dead Reckoning and Top Gun Maverick. I think there was like a lot of pressure to be like, okay, Tom Cruise, you've got to save the movie theaters or whatever, yeah. and I, I think it might have hurt this movie. Yeah, I, I guess so because I don't know if you were, if you were expecting. I don't know if Paramount was expecting, but Top Gun Maverick did. I, I think it did way better than everyone was expecting. It crossed like 
a billion and six hundred uh, millions. And so it, it was like a lot of money and they had a brilliant wind release. It released just for like example, the, I, the movie released in May. I watched it in theaters in August. Just for they, they had like six months. They had it in the theaters for a while. Yeah, it, it just hit Paramount Plus and other streamers in VOD in December. I remember my father watching it at Christmas, the movie. So they were like really brilliant the way they did it. And so I also remember these years Tom Cruise going there and being like the guy. Oh, I am the guy that stayed cinemas. I had a hit that few people were expecting. I, I think most of people were expecting Top Gun Maverick to do good on the box office. But I don't yeah. know if anyone predicted like 1.6 billion. So yeah. Like, it I came think a lot of pressure, 50. yeah. 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 Hey, and by, by, that, by 50, I don't mean $50, 50 million. Yeah, for sure. And, like, people were really expecting this one. And one of the things that I think it made the problem with that expectation is that I said I would talk about that, is the window that they choose to release this movie. I think it was a very bad date that they choose to so basically it released a week before barbie heimer and barbie heimer was something also something that was uh, bigger than expected yeah it was like internet sensation it was like a twitter thing but two months three months before the the release of the movies it was something huge and not only the us but worldwide i went to see barbie in a in a sold out crowd with everyone wearing pink so it was like a, a really that kind of experience that is very unique and paramount chose badly to release a week before and also tom cruise was reportedly mad about it because he lost all very. his premium screens like imax and all other formats due to this because nolan has a agreement with universal that he has to have 60 days of premium premium screens. And Oppenheimer was huge to say on premium screens that it got even more premium X screen screens after that. But yeah, I think that hurt the both of these facts hurt the movie, the pressure after Top Gun and also the bad scheduling before Barbieheimer that was that is the biggest phenomenon uh, on cinema this year. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think Barbenheimer was a big contributor because I, it, it was interesting. Almost, I, I feel like I tweeted this before, but I think I, I don't remember a lot of people even talking about Mission Impossible when oh. it came out. I, which is really rare for those who have been alive during an Mission Impossible thing. It it tends to be like a the event like Top Gun Maverick was. But instead you had Oppenheimer and Barbie was like right there. Uh what was it, a week after? Two weeks? Yeah, it was a it was a week after. And also when uh, Mission Impossible was releasing at that July July I, oh. I think it was it was thirteenth I think it was July 13th that it released, something like that, or 14th, I don't remember. July 12th. Yeah, yeah, July 12th. They were happening the first press screenings for Barbie and Oppenheimer. So when the movie was releasing, people were talking about Barbie Heimer because the first press screeners was, screenings were, I remember, like the movie was going to release at Friday and Barbie had the first on a Monday. And people the whole week was talking about the sessions that happened on Monday, not about Mission Impossible that was going to release on the Friday. So, yeah, it's quite crazy that it was, uh, yeah, again, it was like a, a bad choice by Paramount. I think it could, even in like, August, they could release in August. August had nothing of September, but yeah, yeah it happens. It was, they underestimated the Barbie Heimer. I think all of those did. But Powerbond was the biggest loser of this underestimation. Yeah, and I think 
the other thing they underestimated is the July box office boom oh, that happened this sure. year. Because I feel like in July, I was going through the, or for a specific period in the summer, for a while, I was going every week. Uh, yeah. Because there was, yeah, yeah, there was like a new blockbuster. And it was just, okay, by the time Mission Impossible, by actually by the time Barbenheimer rolled around, which I did do the Op and Arby for those one day, <laughs> by that time I was like, okay, I am good for a few months. I yeah, uh, I want to watch a movie in my home. I want to watch screeners. Yeah, I, I want to yeah, watch screeners. I, I don't want to watch. Yeah, I really... no, I I watched Barbenheimer. I watched Barbie on a Thursday because here in Brazil movies were not they don't release on Friday. They release on Thursday. So I watched a Barbie on a Thursday, and then I watched Oppenheimer on a Friday, and yeah, and you, you're talking about like the the boom of the box office. I, I think that it started in late Ju uh, late June because there, uh, every week was like a big blockbuster, like Transformers and Indiana Jones, and I think there were others, but the Mantles, the Pixar, the Flash. All of them was in June, late June, starting July, and then we have Mission Possible, and then we have Barbie Hire. I think it's a, a period that we had a lot of movies and a lot of box office flops. Most of them were flops, I think, due to that window. Yeah, for sure. But I'm grateful that period is over. <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> It's unfortunate, unfortunate for Mission Impossible. I, I do think, however, given how many people that like home media i think since it's now out digitally now it's it's going to be out next week on 4k blu-ray yeah out in what december for paramount plus probably or something like that I don't, they haven't set a date but i'm assuming december yeah november december um i think it'll get that push that it needs to be like okay People are talking about it again, just right in time for the VF, uh, VFX bake off at, at the Oscars and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. I, I think talking about like awards prospects, I think it, it has a shot on like sound and VFX. Like the sound design and the sound mixing is brilliant in this movie. And, but again, like it, unfortunately, it released before. Oppenheimer. So we like we watched a Mission Impossible. Oh, the sound work is very good here. The sound design is very good. And next week you watch probably one of the best sound works of all time. I don't know. The the explosion, the, the bomb explosion is one of the greatest scenes involving sound that I remember watching on a big screen. So yeah, it's a very good work. But when you compare to to Oppenheimer, it's unfortunately it it unholds. Yeah, maybe Oscars will budge this year and get stunts in there. Pick yeah, yeah, I think they won't. It's too late no. now. It's October, but yeah, I hope the SAG. If you have the SAG Awards, uh, let's hope that the SAG after strikes will be over until there, and the actors get their. Unfortunately, we don't know because SAG after released a statement yesterday saying that the studios were not willing to pay what they offered and they did not were they were not open for a counter offer. So let's hope it's all due to studios when they decide to do it, they will. But we still have the SAG after stand category Mission Possible will for sure appear, I believe. Yeah, for sure. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful work. Yeah. But now that we've talked about the background, I want to get your overall thoughts on the film. Anything you want to mention? Okay. Yeah, just what what were your all thoughts on the film? Uh, Actually, yeah. before that, because I feel like this is a wrap up kind of question. But let's talk about the new cast members. How did you feel about them? Great. Let me just yeah it's grab some Hilly of the Atwell, names here. Yeah. Uh, Asai Morales. Tom Clementif, uh, Shea Wiggum, Carrie Ells, and Greg Tarzan Davis, among others. So overall, I, I would like to start with Eze Morel Gabriel. I don't like the character that much. I have I, I have some problems with it. 
and I'll talk about that, about the story question, and also in the spoiler discussion. But I think that the character the, the character has a problem of development, and it's just like throwing off at the the story. They need a they oh, they need a antagonist for Ethan Hunt, and they created this one, and that is not like the compelling. But we have, and also I think it's the case for Tom Clancy's character. I, I like, I enjoy her very much in other movies, but her character Paris is not used well. She's basically got an ex-machina character in the term scene. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I don't like it. She Wingun, uh, Jasper Briggs enjoyed, but I think it's because she Wingun does a very good uh, agent and he's like charismatic and some of his jokes works very well. Hayley Atwell has chemistry with Tom Cruise, but I have a problem that does not involve her character. I think that Rebecca Ferguson's character is a way more interesting, romantic, and also the... Oh, we'll couple. talk about that. Spoilers, yeah. we will talk about that. I think that Ilza is a way better character to compose that the couple and etc. But she's great in here. I like Haley Atwell and other works. So yeah, she's great. And Greg Carson Davis and Carrie Elwells, I think they do like decent jobs, but not remarkable. Not something that oh pops off my head. Is that I have to cite that. Nothing like that. But yeah, overall, I think Shia, Wingang, and Hileato are very good. And unfortunately, ESI and Pong has bad characters to <laughs> to work with. Yeah, I guess dodging spoilers, because I think the same way, I'm of the same accord. Let's see, how can I dodge spoilers? I'll just say <laughs> that per Pong Clementis' character, Paris, to me, she was just screaming all the time. Yeah. And we never get to, and this isn't a spoiler, we never get to know who she is other than yeah. this random person that travels with a, a side. Yeah, I don't know why she dresses the way she dresses, like why the makeup, I don't get it, like the, all the makeup, the, the clothes. And yeah, I think it's, as I, I have said, Bon Clentiff is, is a good actress. And she's very good in some interviews with Sean and Bag and Rebecca Ferguson. But unfortunately, she, her character is not that good. Yeah, and Asai just didn't... I, I don't know about you, he just didn't come off as a villain to me. Um, no, yeah. Yeah, that's all I'll say about Asai before we get into spoilers. <laughs> but Yeah, we will talk a, a lot about it. But with that said, let's lightly... Talk about the story. What did you think of where the story went? Kind of overall. Okay, yeah, I, I, I'm. I'll try to dodge some spoilers here. And as I said in in, in the beginning of the conversation, it does really feel like a part one because I, I think it's it's structured that way. And and I I don't really feel that there is a third act in the movie. It feels like a big, a big first act, a big first act, and the train scene action piece, the biggest action piece in the movie, is like a a second act, and the third act is the whole part two. Uh, at least I felt the way. It's not Spider-Man across the Spider Verse. That it it is a part one, and sometimes it feels like a a part one, but it also worked like a. a a three act movie and it's well developed. And here is, I feel like, a big, a huge, really huge, because the movie has two hours and 40 minutes of a first and second act. So I, I feel this, this is a bit problem. And also, I like to say that sometimes I feel that the movie is a bit too long in, in terms of rhythm and tone. Some some scenes could be like polished better, and, and sometimes I, 
Yeah, I wouldn't say an hour, but I would say 30 to 40 minutes, maybe. I think it could be up to an hour and, and a minute. Yeah, I know that the, the director and Tom Cruise felt that they need to tell the story in two hours and 40 minutes. But sometimes it's that kind of movie, I don't know if it's adding or, I don't know, the writing. But sometimes it's that kind of movie that some scenes you look at your watch to see if it is, if it is finishing. I have done that. I think one or two times during the, the sessions. Yeah, but, there was... Go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Yeah. Um, you can see. There was a lot of times where I was just, like, looking around and seeing if people were, like, still watching the movie. Because I was like, I, I can't be the only one that's having a bad time here. But <laughs> nobody was, like, looking around. I was the only one looking around and bored. So... I also did that, but I do that for all the movies that I go see in theater. It's because I have ADHD, so sometimes it's hard. Yeah, it's hard for me to like to focus. And in movies that are like long, I have a lot of troubles. But this time it was nice because I went to see it on a packed theater. It was like sold out, and I watched on the. It was interesting because this movie premiered on a. Wednesday here in Brazil, like Paramount decided to <laughs> release it on a Wednesday, like the special date. And I think it was, let me see in the calendar. But yeah, it was also uh, July 12, it was also on a Wednesday. And it was simultaneous. But a lot of people were there. And it was interesting because I, I went to see with two friends that have not, uh, never seen any movie, any Mission Impossible movie. And this was the first one. And they enjoyed, and so I, I, I thought to myself, oh, if you enjoy this one, you are going to enjoy like Ghost Protocol, uh, Rogue Nation, and Fall Mode even more, even more. Not that this one is bad, I like this one. I think that the action scenes are great, but uh, in terms of story, I have a, a bit of problem. I think it's really focused on the action sequences, the action pieces, and not on the, the plot stories and the plot points. So I have problem with the with Gabriel <laughs> background. That scene in in Venice, the whole like Venice thing, I I think it's it's good. The action pieces are good, but it does not make a lot of sense. <laughs> some decisions that they they do there. I'm going to talk about that in the spoiler discussion about something that that Gabriel uh, tells Ethan about a decision that for me does not yeah. make uh, <laughs> much sense. But okay, and so yeah, the story is flawed. It has, uh, I think it has a lot of flaw, flaws up, that are not like so apparent in the other movies and the other three horror movies. So yeah, I had I had a kind of a bit of problem with the story. Yeah, same. And I, I think for those watching it solo, I think, you will really like MI3 if you like this movie. Um, yeah, I think it's yeah, I think it's similar. Yeah, it's no, it's not similar. It's very similar. It's very similar. Like story points. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. without the lens flares. Yeah, the and the uh, the camera is not trembling all the time, and I think that McQuire directs a a lot better. This one, the Gigi Abrams, but also Mission Impossible 3 was the first movie that Gigi Abrams has ever directed. It, it, and for me, it's crazy. Oh, the first movie that you're going to do is a That makes movie. a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> no, yeah, it, it does because Jay was like a huge name on TV. At the time, he had done Lost and other things. And Lost was like a huge success at the, at the time. And yeah, he's also like, Spielberg team, so it makes sense to start doing a, a, a big blockbuster. But yeah, it's very similar to Mission Impossible 3. Because yeah, Mission sure. Impossible 3 also feels like a, a feral. I don't know if you have this, this, this sensation, but I when I watch it, I have the feeling that Mission Impossible 3 is kind of a feral. It, it feels like Tom Cruise was, oh, if 
if this is the last movie, the story is closed. And sure. yeah, so I think this is why it, it makes similar to this one. Yeah, for sure. There's a yeah. Oh, well, I won't get into why I think that, but but you said you wanted to talk about music. Yeah. So I'll just let you take it away. Uh, what did you think about the score from uh, Lauren Balf? I would like to just start in saying that Lauren Balf has done something that is very big and ambitions that he, he has record with different orchestras in different parts of the world. So he recorded in the US, Austria, England, and I think Italy. So he recorded a lot of orchestra and mixed it that after in the post-production. And I think that is, yeah, you can hear it. <laughs> that is like mixed and is very different. It, it feels like a, a Frankenstein kind of score because it does not like, it's not cohesive. I think it some scenes lacks like the action it needs on the music, like the drums and the like, even since I, I think it lacks a bit of tension. And I understand La, Lauren Balf being that ambitious, like he's a, we are, we are talking about Jay Abrams being a Stuart kid. Lauren Balf is a Hans Zimmer kid. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he, he worked with Hans Zimmer. And Lauren Balf, Hans Zimmer is a, a guy that he's doing like the Dune music score for the last four years. Yeah, so you can, that it's very ambitious, but it lacks a lot of emotion and complexity on the, uh, the score. And also, I feel that he does not use it well. The Mission Impossible theme, the it's first time here. that, yeah, I think the first time and maybe the only time that you hear is when Ethan Hunt is escaping the airport. Uh, yeah. And it's like. An hour? Actually, Is that's not true. I heard it three different times. Oh, okay. So it, I can and remember. it was all in the action sequences. It's like a, uh, it's not the full theme. Um, it's like notes from it. He used like the musical cues. Okay. So yeah, I I think that I, now I love that you talked about. I, I remember at the train. I I think the train sequence had a bit of the, of it. But yeah, I I, I don't like it that much the score by both. I miss Giacchino. I think that Michael Giacchino's score for Ghost Protocol is very good for the series. But yeah, Lauren Balf, yeah. And unfortunately, he's going to do the part two. But okay, let's wait to hear it. Yeah, yeah. It's funny you mentioned Michael Giacchino's score for Ghost Protocol because while you were mentioning the theme, I was thinking of how Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol opens. And yeah. with that's or not opens, but when it cuts to credits, there's that whole prison scene with Ethan, and you don't hear the Mission Impossible theme for a solid five ten minutes, and then Ethan says, "Light the fuse," and then it's, ah. and you can like just hear it in the background, and then it just like kicks in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it didn't their, hear. Yeah, the orchestration is very huge. Jack does a very huge orchestration for it. And yeah, I think that Balf <laughs> does not do that, but okay, that's... Uh, yeah, I think Balf his has... thing is more motifs. I think he likes motifs, using motifs more. Yeah, for sure. I think, yeah, it, it has, I think, that one main motif. I was going to say the scene. I, I'm going to say the in, in the spoiler. But in the Venice scene, that is a, like, a very important scene in Venice that he uses motif. That is like the emotional motif. Then I like it. I think it's very effective. But for me, it's just it's this one motif that is is used and is used very well on the scene. I have to get to give the editors and both the credit. It's very good in the scene. The, the... Yeah, but with that said, I think we we've avoided spoilers for as long as we can. I think <laughs> this will be the last thing before we get into spoilers after this question, everything will be spoilers. Yeah. So I just want to get your overall thoughts on the film and then we'll give our final rating for the film before moving into okay. spoiler discussion. 
Great. Yeah, I know that I said most about like the parts that I played, but uh, to be honest, I I really enjoyed. I had a great time with this movie, uh, and I think it's uh, it's a good movie to watch like with your friends, even if they haven't watched the end of the series, because it's a, sure. it's the kind of action uh, movie that I think it lacks in today's blockbusters because it's really well directed. Uh, Christopher McGuire has a kind of classical type of guy that does very good uh, action sequences that car chase in, I think it's home, Rome, that he does in, in a, like a small Fiat, small Fiat car against like huge military vehicles. It's very fun. So yeah, I really like the action scenes and yeah. The action scenes make it for make it up for the the bad emotional plots and also the lack of development that Isai and and so on characters have. Yeah, for sure. What's your final rating for the film? So we are rating one to five or one to ten. Whichever one's more comfortable for you. I a lot of my guests use one to ten. When did that? Okay, yeah, I think it's better, because I'm I'm used to letterbox and letterbox are one to five, Same. and sometimes it's I, why, yeah, it, yeah, it's why I do five stars and all that stuff. Yeah, sometimes I want to give a movie like seven and a half, and I can or eight and a half, so I have to give it like a four star. But yeah, I already uh, so my my grade, my final rating would be like. Eight and out of ten, like due to the. Yeah, I had a really. I know that. I noticed your face. I really had a great time watching it. Like the action scenes are really good, but I think that like the, uh, maybe it, it's more like a eight, go into a like a seven point seven and a half, but it's a eight. It's a like uh using Anthony Fantano's ratings for his music reviews is like a light eight. It's not like a solid eight or a strong eight. It's like a light eight. Is that kind of eight that it can go through a it's, seven it's and a light. half? Yeah, it's a light eight. It's a light eight. It's not a strong eight. It's not a light eight. But if I watch again, like the the, the movie, the the score can can drop. What about a yard rating? Yes. Yeah, so I'm about to upset ninety percent of people, <laughs> um, or at least that's what I think. Um, I hated this movie. I was bored. Uh, I'm a big plot person. The reason why I liked Mission Impossible Fallout so much is because it followed through on characterization of the villain, of all the characters, even the new ones. It really, Fallout and all the other Mission Impossibles, even when they were bad, they were still like, oh, this is fun. This wasn't fun for me. So yeah, I'm about to upset a lot of people. I just really didn't enjoy it. Yeah, I didn't have fun with it. I This is probably 2, 2.5 for me. Uh, if we're using a 5-star scale, probably similar if we're using the 10-point 10, 10 scale. I just really... I don't know my official letterbox rating, but yeah. I, was, I, think, uh, it's, I, I think it's a 2.5. Two, two Reading. Yes, I have read your review before the podcast, and I think it's a two and a half, two and a half. Yeah, so yeah, that's about where I'm at because it was such a massive letdown. Of it felt, I don't know if you got this feeling, but it almost felt like somebody tried to make a cheap parody of movie of Mission Impossible. <laughs> like what somebody like if somebody woke up from a dream and tried to tell you what this movie was about, that's what it felt like. Like a scary movie parody of Mission Impossible. That's what it felt like at least. The I, I did felt this way, but yeah, yeah, I under, uh, understand you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So yeah, that's my final thoughts on the film. Before we get into spoilers, if you haven't seen it. Go see it. It you can buy it now on digital as of this recording. It's twenty bucks, but if I'm sure it's, I think it's out next week, the seventeenth, on Blu-ray and 
probably would be available for rent for six ninety nine. So pause the podcast right now, whether you're on YouTube, your podcast player, whatever you're using to listen or watch this in, and come back later. Just m- make a note. With that, we have a lot to talk about with spoilers. Where do we want to start? Should we just go chronological? Mm. Yeah, I think we can go chronological. Yeah, so, there, there, there's a lot to talk about. It. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. So we get introduced to the entity in a yeah. prologue scene with a next generation Russian submarine, the Sevastopol. Oh, I forgot about this scene. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's what it's and it's what bookends the movie. I'm assuming uh, it really doesn't give it a clear thing, but I'm that's what I'm assuming where part two will pick off from. Um, because at the end of the movie, they're like, hey, we need to find the conform key. And then, oh, hey, we found it. <laughs> and then they yeah. show the ocean. <laughs> but yeah, the entity activates itself and like attacks a tar- target and fires a torpedo back on itself. So let's talk about the prologue. This prologue was so insanely stupid. Yeah. I agree. Because at first I'm like, oh, cool. This is like the AI going rogue and whatever, right? You don't know it at the time, but then you realize it's an AI. Anyways, but it gets so retroactively stupider the more you get into the movie. Because it's like, what do they say to themselves or about the entity? They're like, it was saving itself or something like yeah, making sure people can get to it. And I'm like, so it blew itself up to make sure people couldn't get to it. It, what uh, they call it, they call it smart for doing that. What if I was an AI and I saw, oh yeah, I'm gonna blow myself up. That causes more attention. That the that's the whole crux for why this mission happens in the first place is because somebody noticed it. Like the entity could have just been on a ship. Nobody would have ever known, but no. It fires on itself, and we lost contact with the Sevastopol. So, Ethan, you've got to uh, figure it out. Yeah, that was just stupid to me. Yeah, it, it's so stupid. And yeah. yeah, go ahead. What I was going to say is that it feels like it feels like that that parodies of James Bond in the sixty and the seventy that movies that that they they used to do Casino like the first Casino Royale was like a parody of James Bond. And that type of movie that this type of movie is like the Cold War the spy thriller that Hollywood did back in the day. They were like filled with scenes like that. They are like stupid, but they are proposedly stupid, I think I, I think. And here not, I think the problem with this prologue is it it is stupid, as you said. It is so stupid. But they do it in a serious and formal way. Like, oh, this movie is serious. It's a serious movie. So you need to, oh, no, this is serious. And it's so stupid. I think, in theory, it can be a, a good scene. The action is okay, but it's, yeah, as you said, it's very stupid and it does not make sense. And a problem that I have that I didn't talk in the spoilers free is that this, this them keep, oh, it's two of them. And at one time is oh we have one and the other is in the sea and the other scene is oh no it magically appears from the sea it's now on earth and people can take it and I think it's very confusing and logical the way that they talk about the key and no it's a bit of a mess this key thing so like the prologue it's it's not good at all yeah and then yeah it's it's not good at all. And I think another bad part is how Ethan gets introduced in this movie. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Look, I get people love the masks. I get it. And it was cool to have Ethan rip off his mask and reveal that it was Ethan and not the whatever agent he dressed up as. But, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, that's not how Ethan gets revealed. But yeah, it so let, I, I guess how Ethan gets revealed is 
in the Arabian desert looking for Ilsa. And then he goes uh, to that. No. Then he goes to the CIA, well, right? Well, 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 he goes to CIA first, and then he goes. Oh, he goes to, to the CIA first, and then yeah, he... because yeah, because uh, some tells him that uh, Ilsa may have the key. Okay. So they all, Ilsa may have the key, and she's not a reliable person, and no, she works for the entity and all like that stuff. And then he goes to the desert. Okay, yeah, that makes. But sense. I agree with you. It's not. Yeah, I agree with you that it's not a. <laughs> it's fun, but it's you could do it other way. But I feel like it would have been a even cooler thing to be like, oh no, Carrie Ells. He dresses up as Carrie Ells, but he's already in the room. That would have been like, oh, that would have been funny. Um, yeah, for sure. Because there are more humorous moments in this movie than in any other one. And yeah, I, indeed. Yeah. yeah, and I feel like it would have been cool to just be like, "Oh, my cover is blown. The guy <laughs> who I'm dressed up as in the is in the room here." That would have been at least a funny way to do. And then the action explodes in the room. Yeah, it would be that, way. yeah. It would be that cool. way you don't have a, have a random guy in the back of a room put a mask on and then throw a grenade in the middle of the IMF. <laughs> yeah, and somehow doesn't get caught. Like, I know I'm supposed to suspend my disbelief, but I have suspended my disbelief too far at this point. And I'm not, yeah. what, we're in like 15 in, minutes into the movie, if that? Yeah, 20, 20 minutes. But yeah, you've got that, and then you he gets to ask, what, hey, you've got to find Ilsa because she's got half of the key, half of the crucifix, cruciform key. Cruci yeah, cruciform <laughs> key. Yeah. Uh, and then, quite possibly, the worst storytelling decision Christopher McQuarrie made happen here. He, he, he Ilsa, quote unquote, dies, and then, yeah. and Surprise, I'm going to jump back. Yeah. And jumping up forward a little bit here, it's revealed that, he, no, he faked her death, and then later on, she actually dies. It's. Yeah, it does make sense. It does not make sense. It, uh, it's emotional, yo, and I am not going to play emotional, yo. Yeah, yeah. as I said in the spoiler free when I was talking about Boff's score, I think the only time that it, it, it works is in the Vanity's death of Faust, of his Faust. But I think it's more about the character than the score thing, per se, but yeah. I didn't like either. Also because I talked in the spoiler free also about like the decision that Gabriel says to him, oh, you have to make a decision or Haley Atwell is going to die or use a false is going to die. And it makes no sense. I know that he has a past. They try to connect to the other movies. And then it's similar to Mission Impossible 3 that he tries to save everyone, save Michelle Monaghan and Simon Pegg and everyone. And it does not work, and they try to do a callback here. He trying to, but actually it worked because Michelle Monaghan is alive in all of. But here it does not make sense to me. Oh, you have to choose between two persons, and he chooses Hilatful. He just met her. I know she's a high qualified bandit, but is a false. Is he part in crime? And also what I don't like about her death, besides loving the character, is the way that is telegraphed. If you watch the movie, you understand that she's going to die. There's, yeah. no, there's no mystery. That scene that she's hugging Ethan and Simon Pegg on a balcony in Venice. I don't know if you remember this, the scene where they, they are talking and she hugs him and she hugs Simon Pegg. And you're like, oh, we are this beautiful, messed up family. You know that she's going to die. And it's very telegraphed. And I don't like the book. I don't like it. I don't like it. The way that they do it. And what makes it particularly, I, I don't want to say painful, uh, because that, but off-putting to yeah. me was 
that they've had death fake outs in Mission Impossible. It's a, their main thing is yeah. faking out deaths. Um, uh, everyone at this point has <laughs> faking out of death. There was that near the end of Fallout, Ethan has a dream that he, he and Michelle Monaghan, his former wife, die in a nuclear explosion. But that was just a fake out. And so that was done well because it, was, it had store, served a story purpose of, hey, Ethan is really caught up in his past and, and things like that. But with this one, it just felt, oh, we have a new character, so we got to kill somebody else off. Yeah, I found this way too. And I, I think it's not when you put in, like, it's not worth it, I think. I like the actual character. But I think that Ilza at this point is a very memorable part of the crew. And I think she's as important as Simon Spag character. And I don't want to, yeah, I hate it that she died. And I don't know, maybe, yeah, it is something that I, I was asking myself after the movie ended. Yeah, they can bring her again, like they did to Michelle Monaghan in the part two. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I There was some rumors that at the time that maybe that she was killed in the movie due to her schedule because she was shooting Dune Part 2 at the same time, etc. Uh -huh. But, yeah, Dune is going to release right now. Probably Part 2 is going to be postponed. So, yeah, they can bring her back, not to be like a ghost or a flashback, but they can relieve her character again. Yeah. And look, I'm not mad. We trade one mommy for another mommy. I'm okay with yeah. that. Um, yeah, for sure. I just want Ethan to be happy, but we both know that's not going to happen. No. Also, I think his one true... I, I think Ethan's person is Alana, aka the White Widow. I, I think if I had to like Theorycraft, that's his person. But... Yeah, I agree. I, I think... Yeah, I think that he has relationship problems. I think he should be like alone because every woman he goes with, they die. Yeah, it's, I think it's very <laughs> problematic. But <laughs> Eden is a problematic person, but yeah, for sure. I, I think he's a, a loner. I think he's a lone yeah. ranger. Yeah. yeah, even to the point of in the flashback, with his former, what was it, his former partner? Yeah, um, his former wife. Yeah. It, it dies because Ethan refused to choose or something like that in the past, and that's why it, it was so weird, man. Let's let's talk about Sai for really, or Gabriel for a little bit. The retconning, the retconning of a villain from Ethan's past when you literally brought actors back from the previous Mission Impossibles that you could have used for that very same purpose. What are we doing here? Yeah, um, I agree. Who Who is it that uh, rejoined the cast um, uh, is back in this one? And you could have literally, like, the e Going back to Ilsa, he's the one who put the bounty out on Ilsa. Like, yeah. Could, I, why do we? Why do I need Gabriel, a guy? And then, and, and we found out that he is the guy that is he is making a deal with Vanessa Kirby's character. Yeah. So like, he could be like he could be the villain. He could be the villain. Yeah, you don't even need Gabriel. Either, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I agree with you. Other than, I don't know, to be the human voice for the entity? But what I, are we I doing think, here, guys? I think that it would make sense. Yeah, he being the... He being the... Like, the human voice to, to the entity, because he's inside the government. So, yeah, he has, like, the, the old is structured to the technology, etc. So, yeah. I think it yeah. would make sense. Yeah, for sure. It, but yeah, 
gosh, what else do we have to talk about? I guess I feel like the movie just deliberately shuffles pieces off the board procedurally throughout the movie to be like part yeah they'll probably return in part two luther is hey i'm gonna go work out on my farm or something like that because the the ai can't can't track me down i i forget the reason he gives but he's i'm gonna sit this one out or something like that he's gonna be in part two and then and he's probably dying in part two too yeah, yeah, I feel the way. I feel the way, yeah. Because he has a whole speech of, like, how important is the mission to you? What's the purpose of the mission? Yeah, and they have that. We don't talk about that yet. But the, this whole, like, moral mission of when you enter the MIF and the mission possible is to redeem from your sins, like, all your crimes and all stuff that you have done before. They were like deplorable, and they try. They do that to the Hilly Atwell character, and yeah, I think it's pretty obvious to me that they will kill one of the the trio, and this person is Luther. So yeah, is again is very telegraphed again. Yeah, and then like Paris is oh. She's alive. she's alive. Now she's dead. Now she's alive. Yeah. And they, they do that a lot. And, and when the movie finishes, I, I think she's she's dead or she's alive. I don't remember. Yeah, because uh, at the end of the movie, she's alive. She's alive, yeah. She joins the IMF. Oh, okay. Yeah. I Along yeah. with Grace. The only reason I remember it because is I did a specific spoiler warning episode on this where I wrote down all my notes and everything like that. And it was just like, okay, we are getting so desperately set up for a part two that it almost hurts the way it ends because it's, oh, you could go on a 30, you could add another 30 minutes to this movie and it would be over. Yeah. I thought it this way for a movie that has two hours and 40 minutes. It does not need to have a, another two hours and plus 30 minutes of movie it's yeah it is not necessary to finish it sorry i feel like i think you remember what i'm talking about but like that early 2010s tendency of adapting young adults books that was like yeah. this thing they had 150 pages into two two hours and 20 minutes movies that has nothing to say, like, uh, I remember the most example that I can use is, like, the Hunger Games, like, the part one, part two, that could be, like, one movie of an hour and 30 minutes, and it would be fine. But... I've got a uh, more egregious example for you. Yeah, go ahead. The Hobbit. The Hobbit, yes. They took uh, a book that is this thing. I have this book at home. And my edition is a bit bigger because they try to get a lot of adults from Tolkien. And they do, yeah, I enjoyed Hobbit. I watched at movie theaters. It was fun. But it's it's ridiculous that you turn a 200, 300 page book into three movies of two hours and 40 minutes. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And this the ending had a very similar of Dead Reckoning Part One had a very similar feel to how Desol Desolation of Smaug ended. Oh yeah, where they're like, "Hey, this thing is happening right now," but oh, credits. Yeah, it's like, wait, what? <laughs> um, yes, because in the Desolation of Smaug, uh, we can talk because this year makes ten years anniversary of it. So yeah, is it spoiler free now? Officially spoiler free. Yes, it, it ends with small running away from the mountain and putting fire in the whole village. And they and, and then they cut it into credits and put that Ed Sheeran song, I See Fire. <laughs> and I felt the same way here. There's not a, a, a Ed Sheeran, an, an Ed Sheeran song, but it has that terrible buff score. And they finish here, and oh, you have to wait one more year to watch it. But in this case, I think it's more than a year due to the 
like after and the uh in the WGA the jury strike is over, but they have lasted a hundred and forty days, so a lot of movies will be affected. Yeah, the current date is June twenty eighth, twenty twenty four. I do not think it hits that date. No at all. No. No, because an example that I used earlier, and I use it again, is that Spider Verse, uh, Beyond Spider Man Beyond the Spider Verse, was postponed, and it does not have a date yet. I think that Mission Possible will have the the same thing, probably like 2025. If I'm not wrong, I think that 2025 is is not a crowded year. If I'm not wrong, and I think there is not like big blockbusters and etc. Probably be some Marvel thing, and but no, there is not. Oh, or it's Star Wars thing. I also think that it, there is a Star Wars thing in 2025. But I think it may be better to Paramount to put this in 2025, and they better choose a, a better date for part two because. Again, they they were very stupid to to put this against Barbara Heimer. Uh, I yeah. will I will give them free advice right here right now. Go Austin, do it. You know how January is always perceived as you don't release movies in January. Yeah. It, release in January. Like, yeah, it's called like the like the dump season. Yeah, something like yeah. that that you yeah that you you release movies that you don't want it. Yes, I, I think it's, yeah, it, it's right because there is no competition. There are only Oscar dramas and for international features you have, yeah, you have some right releases and this is not like the first time in recent years that Paramount do, the, <laughs> do this. They have done last year with Babylon. They have released Babylon a week after Avatar 2. And that's really stupid. That's really stupid. Because they were supposed to do like a platform release for it. They were going to release in limited rings and they were going to wide release. I think it was like January 19, something like that. They were just to release on Christmas Day to qualify for the Oscars. And then they, you know, they held back and no, oh, we're going to release wide release on Christmas Day, and it was like a very stupid idea. It was a massive flop, and it's a movie that I really love. So yeah, Paramount, Paramount needs our advice, Austin. <laughs> they need our, our advice. I, because I think the thing, and I got, I got, I get dragged online for saying this, but when I said it. Back in July, I'm like, I don't need a entire month of blockbusters. Spread it out. Just you can release a blockbuster in March next year. We only have the Academy Awards in March. That's it. Yeah, and like, we also have the Mickey Mickey Seven by Bon Jovi. That is, uh, is cat. Yeah. It, yeah, is it actually scheduled in the same day as Dune too? They are both no. Uh, it's, it's no. That's the same day as Ghostbusters Afterlife two. Ah, on the okay. twenty ninth. So, the ninth March. But yeah, we have Mickey Seven. I I think this one will not be harmed by the SAG after strike because I think it's finished. I think it is in post production, and post production does not have. Pickheads or something like that, so they are good to work. But yeah, I I think they they should do that, and I also think that it's a very stupid idea of Warner to release Dune two in March April. I think it's very stupid. It does not do that. Dune is is another franchise that like major studios does not know what to do because the first one <laughs> rollout was terrible, and the second. It seems to to be this way too. Yeah, I've got Dune as March fifteenth. Yeah, it's no, it's not very intelligent. I would bring it to September, August, uh, August, and also I think that MGM, MGM slash Amazon, 
it's a, it's a smaller movie. It's right. But uh, they also have challengers like that. Luca Guadagnino movie to March or April. So like the studios, <laughs> these studios are putting all like the movies that were postponed to that March and April, which is not very intelligent, but okay. Yeah, literally a week after Challengers comes out on March April, April, April oh, 26th April. is April. Deadpool 3. That is going to be postponed, for sure. This 100%. one is going 100%. I don't see n- no, not, not even either. close. This is for sure a 2025 release. And also I'd like to comment that Hugh Jackman and Ray Reynolds they have a really bad look because it's the second movie <laughs> involving Deadpool and Wolverine that is done during uh, writer's strike. I have <laughs> lower expectations to this. They're very low. Last time they did this was not very good. Yeah, but I think my advice would be release part two in a dead time, like where there's nothing coming out that can even remotely compete against you. Um, yeah, as they did to as they did to Top Gun Maverick. It was releasing in May and it was like yeah, May is summer, but it was like a dead week. So yeah, they should do that again. Yeah, they didn't have anything on the horizon that would directly compete. I guess with that said, anything else spoilery you want to mention? No, I think that <laughs> we talked a lot. And <laughs> we did talk a lot and yeah i think we covered it's yeah it's a movie that has a lot of things to say because it's a two hour and 40 minutes movie but yeah i think that's it uh, i talked about the thing that i wanted to but yeah so i guess what are your hopes for part two then yeah i really hope a better script yeah i don't know why like, this one was this way because my fire is probably one of the best hollywood writers right now for those who, who don't know he has won a, an oscar in 96 or 97 for that usual suspect that brian brain singer movie yep. and he's a yeah, he's a talented writer and also advice that i would give is if you don't know the christopher mcguire letterbox profile go see it it's very interesting he talks about the movies that he likes to watch, and you can see uh, inspiration in that reckoning. But yeah, I hope a better script and as good as action scene, as good as this one. Uh, the train sequence, we did not talk about the train sequence, but the train sequence is very good. I really like the train sequence. I think this was a big part of my boring factor was that there were too many action scenes in this movie. Yeah, I don't need three. I don't need three big action set pieces. Like, I, mm, yeah, that was way too much for me. I was like, okay. Oh, I, actually, this one has four big action pieces. It is like oh. the, the desert, the airport, Venice, and train. Yeah, and it's just, I could just do with the Abu Dhabi airport one. And the train. I don't need every action scene to be a big action scene. Although I, I did like the gunplay in, like, when he's fighting off the people, the bounty hunters. I did yeah. like that. It reminded yeah. me a lot of, of a John Wick style. Yeah, fun fact. The director of photography of this movie, the, he is the John Wick's director of photography. I forgot oh. his name. is like Frazier, Frazier something. I have ruined. Frazier yeah. Taggart? Frisian Tiger, yeah. He is like the, he has done the John Wick 2 or 3. I, I don't, I'm not sure. But yeah, he's like the, he's a director of photography of this one. And yeah, so this is why I think the, the Venice scene is very similar to some of the, <laughs> the party scenes of John Wick's. I think it's very similar. Yeah, and I guess getting back to my hopes for that, less action scenes. I don't need big bombastic action scenes. I'm okay with one or two. 
In fact, even in John Wick 4, it was a lot. And let's see, what else? Gosh, one second. Yeah, I don't need action scenes that are as bombastic as this one was. I need a little bit less of runtime. I don't think I need another two hours. I could pro they could probably get away with 90 minutes, given how they structured the this one as, okay, we've got this. Now we need to get this. I know that won't happen. It's going to be another two and a half hour movie. Yeah, I have a guess that they might do almost three hours. Yeah. What? Yeah. They, they might or, do that. They, they, I definitely think they have a magic number where they're like, if we hit this, it'll be really significant. Yeah, I think the magic number is a bit under the, <laughs> the three hours because the exhibitors do not like movies that are too long because you can only schedule less sessions. So that's why some movies have kind of trouble with sessions. One example that I can give is that this the movie theater that I go only have one session of Killers of the Flower Moon scheduled that is at night because the movie has three hours and 30 minutes. So yeah, it's, it's kind of it has like a magic number. Yeah, I guess I was just referring to how with in game somebody did the math of like runtime and it was like three thousand minutes or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, I but yeah, I, I definitely think I hope that it, we get something like closer to two hours and thirty minutes because I don't know, two, this just felt longer to me. Oh well, yeah, you read really those. But yeah, just get me back to a nice, tight movie. I don't need a lot of things where it's, oh, hey, we have to go here. Now we have to go here. Now we have to go there. Now we have to go there. Just, just go from A to B in this movie. If, if this was really a part two of, and what was originally supposed to be the finale of the entire franchise, by the way, at least this version, I'm assuming, because when they pitched the, these two movies back to back, they were like, this, these two are the final ones, the final Mission Impossible movie. But I'm guessing that's not the case now, which is unfortunate because there does seem to be quite a bit of finality to it. So yeah, I don't know what mo much more I can say about this. I'll just say uh, thanks to everyone who's listened to this episode of the podcast. I've been your host, Austin Belzer. If you've enjoyed this episode, Please subscribe and leave a rating wherever you can on whatever app. I know you can do it on Spotify. I know you can do it on iTunes. If you want to Apple follow Podcast. me. Yep. Yeah, Apple Podcasts. And you can follow me on everywhere except for X at Austin B Media. Except for Twitter where it's Austin B Media underscore. And then I guess on Letterboxd, Austin B Movies. Um, all the links to that in the description or the show notes. And Pedro, I want to thank you for coming on and talking about Mission Impossible for a really long time. Almost yeah, really long time. as long as a entire movie. Yeah, uh, we did a bit less than they did. We know when to finish. And yeah, thanks for having me on the, on the podcast. It was really fun to talk about this one. And yeah, thanks for thanks guys for listening. Yeah, it was really cool to, to talk about. Yeah, th thanks. And uh, for those listening slash watching, I'll see you all next time.